last few years, I've had the immense privilege of leading a men's group out of my garage. Some of them are mature Christians, while others are newer to the faith. Some have even been baptized just this last Easter. And we have a wonderful diversity of personalities, of temperaments, and lived experiences. From the Quebecer who grew up in a Christian family to the immigrant who grew up in, a in, a, in a, an atheist family in Turkey. But one thing that's always been shared by all at different times over the years is how difficult it can be to come back to God after we've fallen into sin. Because we feel dirty, guilty, weighed down by the shame of it before the holy and righteous God. And the thing is, we know full well that our shame is well-deserved. We know that what we should be doing but we have this little evil, persistent, lingering doubt that whispers in our ear that this time may have been the straw that breaks the camel's back. The one that will earn us the wrath of God and that we don't deserve to be forgiven. And this is partly what we'll be looking at in our text today in Psalm 25. See, this is a Psalm of David that he wrote later on in life. And it gives it that much more weight considering his experience with sin and the grief and shame that comes with it even after so many years. This psalm is also particular in that it's an alphabetical acrostic where almost every verse begins with the consecutive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Now, if your Bible is like mine, in English, this pattern is much harder to discern unless you have these helpful little notes in the margins that tell you so. And what's also of particular interest here is its literary structure, because it's shaped much like the tip of a spear where the whole passage turns around the central axis, that's verse 11. And the first verses is more, are mirrored in the last, and the second set in the second to last, and so forth. It's almost like David is climbing up a mountain in the first half, only to come down from its peak in the second. And let's keep this in, image in mind as we read. Please stand for the reading of the word. Lord, I appeal to you. My God, I trust in you. Do not let me be disgraced. Do not let my enemies gloat over me. No one who waits for you will be disgraced. Those who act treacherously without cause will be disgraced. Make your ways known to me, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. I wait for you all the day long. Remember, Lord, your compassion and your faithful love, for they have existed from antiquity. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my acts of rebellion. In keeping with your faithful love, remember me because of your goodness, Lord. The Lord is good and upright. Therefore, he shows sinners the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. All the Lord's ways show faithful love and truth to those who keep his covenant and decrees. Lord, for the sake of your name, forgive my iniquity, for it is immense. Who is this person who fears the Lord? He will show him the way he should choose. He will live a good life, and his descendants will inherit the land. The secret counsel of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he reveals his covenant to them. My eyes are always on the Lord, for he will show, pull my feet out from the net. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I, alone, I am alone and afflicted. The distress of my heart increase. Bring me out of my sufferings. Consider my affliction and trouble and forgive all my sins. Consider my enemies, they are numerous, and they hate me violently. Guard me and rescue me. Do not let me be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and what is right watch over me, for I wait for you. You may be seated. Father, we turn our eyes to you this morning with fear and confidence. Fear because we know that you are a just and righteous judge and that we are unworthy to be in your presence, crushed beneath the weight and shame of our sin, and confidence because we also know that you are gracious and merciful, that you sent Jesus to the cross for us while we were still dead in our sin, and that you are faithful and just to forgive those who turn from their sin and place their faith in him. We pray that you would lead us by your holy word. May it be a balm to our hearts and a light unto our feet. Please make us receptive to his teaching and lead us in your ways. Amen. So as I've mentioned earlier, one particular particularity of this psalm, this prayer of David, is its structure. 
It's referred to as a chiasm, which is just a fancy word for, for saying that verses, themes, and subjects are mirrored around a central axis, which usually indicates the main point of the passage and helps in its memorization. In this case, we can see it like climbing a mountain. We'll begin the difficult ascent at ground level and make our way up to the main point at the summit, then we'll descend victorious on the other side. Each step in the ascension is important. One could argue that it's only more so with the first step. As the expression states, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. And this all-important first step here also begins with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet in verse 1. In the ESV, it says, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. You see, David begins his prayer in the simplest way possible by calling on the name of the Lord and lifting his attention toward him. One of the hardest things to do when we've sinned is to lift up our eyes or our souls toward God. And it's not like we don't know what we should do or even what the Lord calls us to, but the weight of our guilt before the Almighty God makes us timid. Our shame drives us to find excuses not to read the scriptures, not to pray or worship, or even try not to even think of God as if we could somehow escape his notice. Like little children having made a mess and covered in finger paint from head to toe, trying to hide behind the living room curtains, leaving the obvious evidence of their crime and colorful tracks leading directly to their hiding spot. And you see this reaction, it's nothing new. When we read of the fall in Genesis 3, we see that hiding from God is the very first thing that Adam and Eve did after having sinned for the very first time. But here David leads us in the opposite direction, choosing to the more difficult path he lifts up his soul toward the Lord. And we can see the results begin as early as the ver second verse. Oh my God, in you I trust. See, already he's closer than he began. No longer is he praying to a di the distant Lord, literally here using the name of God, but he's praying to his God, the one in whom he trusts. Now, I don't know about you, but I was the target of several bullies in my youth. I was sometimes mocked, other times physically assaulted, and being rather round, um, I had little hope of making a run for it if confronted. But I found many ways of avoiding the conflict altogether, often hiding out in different, in different dark corners of the school. And these hiding spots were all a really closely guarded secret, known only to me and a few trusted friends. And I still remember the shame of betrayal I felt when one of these sold me out to a bully. It was a far more painful experience than the altercation that resulted from it. And this is precisely the shame that David is talking about. In verse 2, when he says, Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. He's pleading with God that his faith in him wouldn't be misplaced. It wouldn't be a source of shame. But in the very next sentence, his faith is strengthened by reminding himself that the truth that None who wait on the Lord will be put to shame, but it is the traitors themselves who will be ashamed before the living God. So we see here in the space of just a few verses that David's outlook has already begun to change. By choosing to lift up his soul to the Lord, he's coming closer and closer. As he climbs, the more his mindset changes and he seeks after God. As we read on, it's no longer enough for him to not be put to shame, but he becomes teachable. He seeks to know the will of God and to put it in practice, knowing that his salvation comes from the Lord and nowhere else. And when we turn to God in prayer, it's the same attitude that we should present ourselves before him, with humility, being patient and teachable. See, David here is older. He's been a king for a long time. He's the great king of Israel, a war hero many times over. But he presents himself before God with the meekness of a servant, with humility and reverence. And one of the things that really grinds my gears personally is hearing arrogant preachers boast about their accomplishments, the size of their ministry or the influence or how well off they are. It's as if they're trying to seize for themselves the glory that rightly belongs to God. But let's be honest. We've all been guilty of that same attitude in prayer, even if it's a little subconsciously. Our prayers often sound a lot more like, bless me in the way that I've chosen and teach me what I wish to know rather than make me to know your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. It's why we must constantly be reminded that our salvation comes from the Lord and that he doesn't work according to our schedule or our good pleasure, but that we are to wait on him.
If it depended on us, we would still be dead in our sin. I know full well that I'm not saved because I deserved it, or because I'm such a great guy, or because I'm smarter or wiser than anyone else. And that any of those things allowed me to put my own strength in Jesus, by my own strength of will. See, there's no salvation by pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. Even David, the great king, of which the Holy Spirit testifies in Scripture that he was a man after God's own heart, throws himself on the mercies and promises of God for his forgiveness. He pleads with the Lord to forgive the sins of his youth on the basis of his steadfast love and for the sake of his goodness, in verse 7. David trusted in the promises of a future Messiah. He didn't even have the advantage of most of the Old Testament. The prophets were to come. The nation of Israel was still in its infancy and had just come out of the dark period of the judges. He could only very, very dimly see a glimmer of a future savior. But we know the end of the story. We know the person of Jesus and his accomplished work at the cross. For David, the Holy Spirit just came spontaneously onto people according to the purpose of his own will and left them just as suddenly when his purpose was accomplished. But we are indwelt of that Holy Spirit permanently. Think about that for a second. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, God himself indwells the believer. So if David, who'd accomplished so much with so little knowledge, could come to God with confidence by the means that God had given him, how much more so can we who are in Christ come to God through the means that he's given us? We have none of David's accomplishments and none of his excuses. And this is where the climber reaches a plateau where the ascension takes a different angle and the approach becomes more contemplative. Notice the change in voice in verse 8. David is pleaded with God to forgive the sins of his youth for the sake of his own goodness in verse 7, and now in verse 8 he begins to contemplate God's character, the very thing he's just relied on. If you remember being a child at some point, you'll remember that feeling of dread of having done something wrong and being forced to face the music of having to admit what you've done and accept the consequences of your actions. The classic example from the cartoons of my youth is the little boy who breaks his neighbor's window with a baseball. After being told, clearly, that it wasn't a good idea to play baseball near to any buildings. As these stories go, the boy will probably make things far worse for himself along the way before he needs to fess up. And then he'll need to face the wrong neighbor to rely on his character for any hope of mercy. And now, depending on what the cartoon was, the neighbor could be kind-hearted and good-natured, in which case there probably won't be much of a consequence aside from a gentle warning not to do it again. And if the neighbor is mean-spirited, he'll keep the boy's ball and threaten to let his mean dog attack the next child to set foot on his lawn. But the most interesting one by far is the neighbor who looks imposing and scary, but is genuinely kind and uses the occasion to teach an important lesson. When we draw near to God in prayer, as David has done here, it's good to have a right fear of the Lord because he is not to be trifled with. He is the just and righteous judge after all. But we must also be reminded of his character, of his goodness, grace, and mercy toward his people if we're to have the courage to draw close and wait for him. And this is exactly what David does here in verse 9 and 10. He reminds himself of God's character as he's revealed himself in his word and by his fidelity that he's demonstrated in the past. In the same breath, David reminds himself of the, that the paths of the Lord are reserved for those who are faithful to him. Look at the contrast, verse 8 and 10. God is good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs the sinners in the way. And in verse 10, all the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and testimonies. See, in verse 8, he says that the Lord instructs sinners in the way, but in verse 10, those who benefit from his paths are those who keep his covenant and testimonies. Doesn't it seem a little contradictory? How could sinners also be faithful? How can those who by definition don't keep the covenant also be those who are faithful in keeping it? But I think the key lies in the middle verse, in verse 9. We see that it's the humble whom the Lord instructs. And in verse 7, it's clear that it's according to his steadfast love that God sees the sinner 
and that he remembers his tra- not his transgressions for the sake of his own goodness. As a little aside, that phrase, remember not, is interesting, isn't it? We know that God is all-knowing, and so by definition doesn't forget. So how then can it be said that he does not remember? I think it's a little bit like when I've been sinned against, and I've been asked for forgiveness, and I've granted it. I, can't, I can then not bring that event up as a bludgeon in a future argument. It's been dealt with. And the expression here is talking about the same kind of not remembering. Not that God forgets, but that he chooses not to bring up our past transgressions. So because of the Lord's proven love and goodness, David can come to him with confidence through the means that he's provided, humbly keeping his testimony, his covenant and testimonies. Which then brings us to the peak of the prayer. The central point around which this whole psalm turns. Verse 11. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my sin, my guilt, for it is great. Or in the CSB, Lord, for the sake of your name, forgive my iniquity, for it is immense. After having lifted his soul up to the Lord and trusted in his teaching, having gathered up his courage and remembered God's character, his disposition towards his people as shown through his actions in the past, David now throws himself at the mercy of the Lord and presents the most convincing argument that he could possibly make, the only one, really, that can be made in the face of the perfect, righteous, and almighty God. For your name's sake, O Lord. David knows full well that if his argument was based on his own accomplishments, it would be insignificant before the creator of the universe. If it was based on his own justice or righteousness, he would be found wanting in the presence of the perfect, just, and righteous king of heaven and earth. But knowing all that, David relies on God's character as a promise keeper, as one who cannot lie. Like Moses before him, when he pleaded with God to spare Israel, when they made for themselves a golden calf in the shadow of his mountain, saying in Exodus 32, Remember Abram, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self, and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised I will give your offspring, and they shall inherit it forever. See, David is taking a page out of Moses' book. He's presenting the same argument, the only one that really can hold, essentially telling God you've given your word and put your own name on the line by swearing by yourself, since there is no one and nothing greater than you that you can swear by. At the heart of this argument is the fundamental principle in Christianity that's become pretty unpopular. The fact that God is for God, that his own name and his own glory are his utmost priority. And in our current society, we like to put ourselves first, to make everything about us, There are never growing list of worship songs that are really all about us. We read and memorize verses like John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his son. But we forget the key fact that his love for us is rooted first and foremost in his love for himself. Now that can seem a bit counterintuitive. After all, from a human perspective, when someone is all about glorifying himself, we say with good reason that he's self-centered, an egotist, or maybe an egomaniac who thinks the world revolves around him. And it's even a biblical principle to be the opposite of that. Humble, as in Philippians 2.3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. But this negative perception of being all about one's own glory is only true if the underlying presupposition is also true that the self-glorifying person has a wrongly elevated sense of himself. Because as humans, we know that we've all been made in the image of God and so are equal to one another in value. But this is precisely what fails to hold true in the case of God himself. He truly is worthy of all worship and praise. He truly is superior to us in every way imaginable and some in which we even lack the imagination for. This is why the greatest commandment, according to Jesus, is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And if it's a commandment, that means that logically it would be a sin to do otherwise. It would be a going against the clear commandment of God. And since scripture tells us that Jesus himself never sinned, this means that he followed this commandment perfectly. So God the Son loves God the Father with all his heart, all his soul, and all his mind. 
And I could spend hours making the case through the Old Testament text and New Testament text that God's ultimate goal in creation, in history, and even in His plan for our salvation is first and foremost for His own glory. And this is the truth that's at the heart of Moses' plea with God, of David's plea with God, of Amos and the other prophets. And this truth is hard to hear for us because we've lost a lot of the fear of God, of this reverence which we should have toward the Almighty. We've taken to heart the lessons of the New Testament, the intimacy that comes with adoption as sons that God has given us by His grace through Christ. But we've unfortunately also lost much of the fear of God in the process. And this fear of God is what David is displaying in verse 11. He is aligning his priorities with those of the Lord. For your name's sake, O Lord. So it's with the glory of God in mind that he lays down his burden. Pardon my guilt, for it is great. Forgive my iniquity, for it is immense. He doesn't minimize the significance of his sin. He feels all the weight of it, and he lays it at the feet of his Lord, utterly dependent on him in all humility. How many times have we prayed to God for forgiveness while at the same time minimizing the significance of our sin, internally saying things like, it's not, that, it's not great, it's pretty bad, but it's not like I've killed anyone. But here the psalmist shows his hand. He holds nothing back and lies entirely at the mercy of the Lord. So it's with a lighter heart that David then begins his descent from the peak. He returns to contemplating God's character. Echoing verses 8 to 10, verses 12 to 14 are now a little brighter, filled with more confidence. Having gripped the promises of God for dear life as a rock climber does the secure and tested handholds during the ascent, he now trusts in God's character like the same rock climber rappelling down. Notice the subtle changes in tone from 8 to 10, 10 to 12. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and testimonies. And then on the way down, in verse 12, Who is the man who fears the Lord? Him will he instruct in the way that he should choose. His soul shall abide in well-being, and his offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. The emphasis on the ascent was on building confidence in the nature of God, his faithfulness towards a sinner and his covenant people as the psalmist prepares his heart and gathers his courage to meet the Lord. But on the way down, the emphasis has changed. They're the same characteristics that are being contemplated, but here it's the... Grateful, it's with gratefulness, joy, and honor at having been forgiven, at having the friendship of the Lord. And I can personally relate to what David's describing here, because I can't count the times when I've had to fight against my own flesh, against my own sinful nature every step of the way to the cross. Each step, a painful battle requiring me to force my rebellious heart to praise the Lord. Everything in my being accusing me, discouraging me, trying to turn me from repentance. I had no choice but to rely on what I knew of God rather than what I felt because my heart was deceitful. I had to rely on his character as he had revealed himself in scripture in order to finally lay my sin at the feet of the cross. And they say that hindsight is 20 20. And that's very much what David is expressing here in the second half of the psalm. See, after having trusted God for forgiveness, he can now more fully appreciate the depths of God's mercy and the grace being recentered in God's ways and to appreciate the secondary advantages that come with walking with God. To continue our trek down the mountain, verses 12 to 14 are like a climber returning to a plateau after having attained his goal. On the way up, he was exhausted, too tired to really notice much of anything except for the rough shape of the place and the fact that it might have just been large enough to put up a tent and to wait out the storm. But now on the way down, the weather's clear. He is no longer burdened by guilt and shame and is well placed to enjoy all the initial benefits, but also maybe also taking the breathtaking sights. When I was a teenager, I spent my summers in odd retreats attending or working at various Christian camps. They're wonderful, very formative moments. I've kept some of my fondest memories from those times. Those moments have helped me develop my relationship with God 
And you know, it's almost impossible not to. With three chapels a day for two weeks straight, morning worship, evening worship, on, time, on top of time set aside every single day for prayer and personal Bible study. But each of these events comes with a serious downside, the dreaded return to reality. No matter how much fun I'd had, how much closer to God I felt, Monday morning always came too quickly. My regular alarm would ring out, and I would quickly realize that the bubble I'd been in for the last little while had definitely popped. I would try to keep that feeling of closeness with God, to keep my eyes on Him through the daily grind and the return of everyday troubles, to keep Him at the center of my life through the anxieties and face the return of the same problems that I'd had before the conference. The world hadn't changed during my time away. Maybe I had a little. And this is what David describes here in verses 15 to 21. This return to reality, that the same old problems that he'd had before, he still has now. But look carefully at the language that he uses, at the themes that he brings back. His eyes are ever toward the Lord in whom he trusts to pull him from the net, in verse 15, just as he trusted in God for salvation in verse 5. He seeks the grace of God in verse 16, just as he relied on his mercy and steadfast love in verse 6. And finally, in verse 20 and 21, he calls on God to not let him be put to shame by his enemies as he waits upon the Lord, just as he did in verse 2 and 3. Having gone up to God and been forgiven of his sins, David now faces a return to reality. None of his previous problems have gone away. His enemies are still there, they still hate him, and they wish to put him to shame. Being right with God hasn't changed his situation, but it has changed his outlook and strengthened his resolve. Look at verse 21 again. May integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. The result of his repentance and drawing near to God is that his own priorities have aligned themselves more closely to God's, and he seeks after holiness. Now, there are a few things that are particularly interesting about the last verse of this psalm. It almost seems out of place, as if it could maybe belong to another psalm altogether. But one thing is that it breaks the pattern. See, the verse 21 doesn't start with the next letter in the Hebrew alphabet. For another, the rest, where the rest of the psalm is an individual prayer, this one is a request on behalf of the people of Israel. Continuing with our image of climbing a mountain, if we consider verse 11 as the summit and the central point, this last verse then is the foot of the mountain, the natural conclusion to the prayer. Just as in verse 11, David pleads for the forgiveness of his son on the basis of God's love for his own name because of the promises that he has previously made to his people, of which he's a member, here he presents a similar argument, if more implicitly, for the people who bear God's name to the nations. After having applied the promises of God to himself as an individual recipient of God's grace and love, having relied on his divine attributes as he's chosen to reveal himself through the prophets to his people Israel, here he comes back to the fact that all of God's promises were made to his people as a whole. Their context is collective. The only reason that David, the individual, can come to God with such confidence that he'll be forgiven for his sin is because God has chosen Israel to be his people and that David himself is a member of this chosen group. Throughout history, God has revealed himself to Israel. He's taught them his ways and disciplined them when they've strayed. He's forged his alliance with them and given them his law. He's made known to them the benefits of walking in his paths and living his ways, and also made known to them the consequences of walking in their own way and paying no heed to his teachings. And he's used them to judge the surrounding nations, and he's also used the surrounding nations to judge them. And so here, at the very end of his prayer, King David widens the scope of his plea. If the individual can come before God, his God, with confidence through the means that he's provided to his people because of his unchanging character, how much more so could the people of God who bear his name and with whom he's made his covenant collectively and confidently trust in him for their salvation? It's also a spiritual truth that the more our eyes are focused on the Lord, the more closely we're listening to his teachings and living according to his ways, the wider the scopes of our prayers tend to become. Which doesn't mean that we can't pray for ourselves. After all, David just spent 21 out of a 22-verse psalm praying an individual prayer. 
but the, that the natural consequences of waiting on the Lord is that His priorities become our own. We become concerned with His glory and His name, and our prayers will naturally reflect a concern for His people. And now there are many types of prayers in Scripture. Some are more general, like the Lord's Prayer. They're a sort of template to follow, Prayer 101, that directs our heart toward God, reorders our priorities, and aligns our will to His, whereas others are so short that we don't even have the words. Like when Nehemiah prays to the Lord in the middle of a conversation with the king as he was serving him. Here David gives us a master class in repentance. He's teaching us by his example that we can turn to God through the means that he's given us with the confidence that we will be forgiven because our forgiveness is based not on our own merit, but on God's character. For David, these means were provided in the law of Moses, known as the Old Covenant, the system of laws and sacrifices given to Israel to cause them to live God's ways and to be his visible representatives on earth. God hasn't changed. We can still come to him today with confidence through the means that he's provided by his grace and for the sake of his own name. But unlike David, we now know the fullness of his love, the depths of his grace. What David only knew in part, we now know in full. Like Paul writes to the Galatians, we're no longer under the guardians of the law, but have been adopted as sons through faith. But maybe you're, this, you're here this morning and you're thinking to yourself, yeah, that's great, but he has no idea what I've done. I don't deserve to be forgiven. And you're right, you don't. No one does. That's why the Christian is saved by grace through faith and not by his own merit as the Apostle Paul writes to the Ephesians. And if you still have doubts because the shame of your sin is eating you up like a cancer from the inside, because you know full well that you yourself would be incapable of forgiving someone if you knew of them what you know of yourself, then know that the man who wrote this psalm, the man that scripture calls a man after God's own heart, when he wrote, pardon my guilt for it is great, is referring, among other things, to the fact that he chose to shirk his responsibilities by staying home from war and sending his armies to fight without him. Then being idle at home committed adultery with one of his men's wives. As if that weren't enough, when she became pregnant from their sinful union, he had her husband called back from the front so that he would think the child was his, and so hide his own sin. But when the man, being faithful to God and his brothers in arms, refused to go to his wife while they were out fighting and dying, David had him sent back to the front, unknowingly carrying orders for his own execution. This is the man who years later is praying with such confidence for the forgiveness of his sins to the God of all creation, trusting that he can come to him confidently through the means that God has provided because of God's great character. Coming to the Lord with a heart weighed down by sin really is a little like climbing a mountain, lifting our eyes up toward the peak. It's more likely that we'll have to gather up our courage because the task really seems impossible. After all, the mountain is high and intimidating. Our God is great. But we begin with the first step, trusting in God himself as our guide to lead us his way. And because he's faithful, he teaches us to walk according to his way, as verses 4 and 5 say, Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. As Christians, we know that Jesus himself is the way, the truth, and the life, as John 14, 6 says. The higher we climb and the more our confidence grows because we're reminded time and again of the character of our great God, his mercy, grace, compassion, love, justice, and faithfulness. And as we reach the peak, we lay all of our guilt and shame at his feet, confident that he will be faithful and just to forgive us because of his love for his great name. Then we begin our descent. Having been unburdened, we're better able to appreciate everything that God has done for us, that he continues to do for us, to truly appreciate the beauty of his ways, and to be better equipped to deal once more with the dark reality of a world who will hate us because they hated our Savior before us. And then finally, as this new joy and freedom grows within us, the joy at living God's way pushes us to share it, to desire that others would discover this freedom that we have in Christ and also be forgiven and unburdened of their sin. As Christians, we've been gra gra grafted into God's people by the means of grace through faith in Jesus Christ.
but our old sinful nature hasn't quite abandoned its grip on us yet. We've been given the desire and capacity to resist and flee sin and to walk according to God's ways. But like David before us, we often fail to do so, choosing instead to give in to our old nature. And this is why we must regularly recenter our eyes on Christ and come to Him with the means that He has provided, confident that He will act toward us according to His promise for the sake of the glory of His name. So if you're still struggling under a weight of sin and you see repentance like a mountain that's impossible to climb, if your shame is causing you to shy away from God thinking that you simply cannot be forgiven because you're incapable of forgiving yourself, I have the joy to inform you that your sin, as dark, vile, and heavy as it may be, is no match for the grace of our Almighty God. So when Jesus said, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life, He wasn't exaggerating. Everywhere in Scripture we see that repentance and forgiveness is given to all sorts of sinners, adulterers, murderers like David, prostitutes like Rahab, both of whom God saw fit to use as ancestors for His own Son, Jesus, as well as idol worshippers, traitors, liars, and thieves. I wouldn't have enough time in a day to list all of the examples that Scripture gives to express the height and width and depth of God's grace. As Romans 5 says, where sin has increased, grace abounded all the more. So we can draw near to God for the forgiveness of our sin with confidence by the means of grace through faith that He's provided in Christ because His character is unchanging. Let's pray. Father, it's with confidence in your great love that we come before you this morning. We pray that you would teach us by your word to walk in your ways. Guide us by your Holy Spirit living in us and pardon our great guilt. It is in the name of your Son, Jesus, that we come to you. May we glorify your great name. Amen.